Early morning on Thursday, September 3rd, 2009, five adolescents were arrested for underage drinking and alcohol possession. The police were responding to a complaint about a gathering of teenagers painting the train trestle in Sydney River, a suburb of the Cape Breton Regional Municipality in Nova Scotia. Almost immediately, the on-again, off-again debate about whether the practice of painting the trestle should be outlawed flared up once more. Opponents of the practice cited both safety concerns and that it made the trestle an eyesore. Supporters, more than anything, cited tradition, that the painting of the trestle was a positive, expressive practice. Indeed, by the end of that week, the bridge was painted once more, with the term tradition, full stop, painted in the ten squares that make up the trestle. In the red and white colors of Riverview High School, the walls were covered with handprints eschewing the signatures of the past, along with symbols expressing how paint plus peace equals happiness. But the argument of tradition did not settle the debate. Representatives from the student councils met with city officials and agreed to put an end to the practice. Ironically, one of the main arguments against trestle painting, that it was an eyesore amounting to little more than graffiti and defacement, was found to be built on feet of clay when the bridge went painted by neither students, nor the municipality, nor the railway. The distinction between decoration and graffiti may be diffuse and hard to articulate, yet the community seemed prepared to make one, and grew restless with the state of the bridge left fallow. The following April, at about the time I first received some research funding for studying the practice, the bridge was painted again, this time in the blue and white of Sydney Academy, the older downtown Sydney school that is Riverview's chief rival. Six months of compliance with the interdiction is perhaps as attributable to a nasty winter as it is to a respect for authority. In a fit of school pride, a group of 10th grade Riverview students painted the bridge the following month. This revealed one of the further meanings of trestle painting. As much as the bridge is a marker of territory between the two schools, it is also a ritual for the graduating class. Students have said that upon enrolling at Riverview, they could barely wait to paint it in grade 12. By jumping the established order, these students had transgressed. In a show of contrition, the painters apologized on their hands and knees in the middle of the school cafeteria. Accounts vary between this being a playful performance to this being hazing. Trestle was constructed between 1957 and 1958 in an infrastructure spree that also saw the completion of the Canso Causeway, connecting Cape Breton to mainland Nova Scotia, and the Seal Island Bridge spanning the Great Bedore Channel of the Bedore Lakes. It was built with the realignment of Trunk 5, the main road between Sydney and North Sydney, and the construction of the new Sydney River Bridge. The old bridge had been a single lane which connected to King's Road, the main road to Sydney, via a steeply curving road that crossed the rail tracks at grade. Accidents, trains, and the one-way bridge made for intense congestion, which the newer bridge and elevated rail line aimed to alleviate. But planners were unprepared for the high demand placed upon the bridge. Traffic was bumper to bumper along the road despite no longer having to stop for trains. The bridge opened on December 1st, 1958. By February 59, the Municipal Council of the County of Cape Breton indicated that the bridge had caused a serious traffic problem along the new road. Riverview Rural High School opened in 1950, following the Nova Scotia Rural High School Act of 1945. Just like the bridge, its use was underestimated. Even before opening, the population survey for the school was twice the initial estimate. The cause of the confusion was not anticipating post-war growth of the suburb in Cape Breton, which had previously only experienced the intensely industrial and the intensely rural. I am dwelling on traffic patterns because the trestle, for all its utilitarian and unesthetic design, forms a conspicuous part of the landscape for a broad swathe of people in the municipality. What one sees every day becomes a meaningful landmark, and one need not be a dyed-in-the-wool ternarian to recognize the liminal aspects of the trestle. Irrespective of actual catchment area for the schools, or for the natural or political boundaries between communities, the trestle bridge marks the entry into Redmond country, hence its back-and-forth painting by Riverview and Sydney Academy. This legacy from an industrial past supersedes the river and the bridge. No different from many traditions, it derives this meaning by virtue of it having been imbued with it once and the process simply continuing. On prom night 1981, Tom Davis snuck out and, using an orange spray paint his father had taken from the steel plant, sprayed Class of 81 onto the ten squares of the trestle. He had practiced painting upside down in his basement, and he was happy to have paid the extra dollar for tuxedo rental insurance. It was, in his retrospect, simultaneously a personal legacy and a collective legacy for his graduating class. In his words, 
It was probably early June of the next year when the kids from class of 82 just rode over the one, made it into a two. But that kind of started off the kids from Riverview saying, we have to paint this bridge for prom. And then it became, well, we got to paint it for prom, and we got to paint it for Red Cup. Pretty much any excuse we could think of is a good excuse to go down and paint the bridge, paint the trestle. And the kids of Riverview took it upon themselves that that's their trestle. And then we got to paint it for prom and Red Cup and Winter Carnival. And going back to school and Christmas break and Easter break and Valentine's Day. In addition to the cycle of school life and matters more esoteric, the bridge has been used to promote causes. There is frequently a bridge for Remembrance Day and one promoting the Riverview team for the annual Run for the Cure breast cancer fundraiser. And in 2004, students painted it to protest a proposed quarry in Cox Heath. Over the years, the bridge has also been used for memorialization. Like roadside crosses, painting is used to mark a death that falls outside of the flow of expectations, principally road accidents. But unlike roadside crosses, which tend to mark the place of the accident, the bridge is understood as the appropriate public marker for grief because of its centrality to the cultural geography of adolescent Cape Breton. Most of the time, these painters are no longer high school students, but return to their painting ways. They will coordinate a memorial bridge paint, often wearing the same clothes and experiencing the same sense of event and performance as they would have in their painting years. There is also a shared understanding that a memorial bridge will go without repainting until an appropriate time has passed, usually about a month. To quote one of my interviews, I witnessed them painting the bridge for that young fella that died on the motorcycle, Johnny Carabin, whose bridge you see here, and I remember sitting back and when they had all finished, and they all kind of stepped back in line and they all looked and then they just bowed their heads, and I thought, wow, that's profound. Like many folklorists, I've been asked whether I support the practice I study. I've also been attacked in local papers for paying any attention to trestle painting at all, for essentially wasting taxpayers' money. Particularly from speaking with my students, many of whom come from the area and are former painters, I am drawn to this effort at expression in a post-industrial dying city as an ongoing example of the processes of folklore.